Um, thank you for the introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I really like this initiative, so please spread the news. Um, I'm reaching to my pocket for my telephone. I'm not twit twittering, but I'm trying to control my computer. So, um, so I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Unfold. It's a spatial design studio based here in uh, Antwerp. And um, actually, it's only two of us and uh, a part-timer uh, who draw us, so she's not in the picture. Um, it was mentioned in the speech of Alain de Botton that um, I really hate this question, what do you do? Uh, because, uh, frankly, it takes me one hour at least to explain what we do, and it just doesn't work in 20 minutes. So um, this is what we do, and um, if you want to know more about it, you just go to our website, you see some products here, uh, projects. Um, but I want to focus on a certain observation we did last year in uh, that field over there. Um, and it is the, um, we call it post-digital design, or design in a post-digital era, because I don't think that the uh, term post-digital only refers to um, design. Um, it was uh, the occasion, or the reason we came up with this, we were working on, a, on uh, developing an exhibition we did in uh, New York, um, in November, and we did it together with six designers and we invited other designers. And when developing the, the, the concept of the exhibition, we looked at the projects we were doing, and the first thing that, was, uh, that came as a team was uh, digital design. But there are lots, lots of exhibitions about digital design, and we did not feel that our work was really about digital designs. We all use digital methodologies and uh, concepts, and, um, but it was not about that, and it was more about something that was in between digital and analog, and which was in between tactile and uh, um, virtual, which was in between... Um, um, yeah, those things. <laughs> um, so we started to to wonder what what was happening, um, and we kind of uh, stole the the theory um, post digital design from uh, Robert Pepperell. I have to uh, look at my notes here. And Michael Punt, they wrote a book um, I think ten years ago, the post digital membrane. I didn't read the book, so maybe I hijacked the term instead of I borrowed the term, but the introduction of the book was really interesting, and um, <laughs> it's kind of um, explained the feeling we had about uh, digital design and the digital revolution and all this buzzing around about Web 2.0 and things about that, and I, I should quote uh, uh, Nicholas Negroponte from the MIT who did uh, One Laptop Per Child project, and he said the digital revolution is over, and it actually is over. We are now in the republic of the digital. Um, so when you look at this uh, very basic timeline here, um, I've, um, it's, it's the analog period or the mechanical electrical period we know from before the 80s or 70s if you were an early adapter. And then in the 1980s we had something like the digital revolution. It was like a giant wave of digitalness that f came over our world. And, Everything would be digitized, and in fact, I think it's still going on. Everything will be digitized, and you see now, for example, one of the oldest media, like books, are finally starting after in the 80s. Some people said, like, e-books, e-books. Finally, it's taking off with the Amazon Kindle and stuff like that. Um, but we believe that, um, actually, th this this revolution is is over. It's here. It's It will never go away, and just face it, accept it, and uh, live with it. Um, so I can maybe best explain it with uh, some examples. Uh, so just uh, we say it's now the, maybe now it's the post-digital era. It's always easier to, to look at uh, 10 years ago and say, oh yeah, then, then it was the digital era or the I don't know what. But it's always hard to look at the here and now and what are we, we doing and try to, to um, explain what's happening now. So um, I've blended the two colors, so the analog world and the digital world, and that might be the post-digital world. It's not the non-digital or anti-digital, because some people believe that with this term we mean anti-digital, uh, but it is not. 
one example, when the digital revolution started in the 80s, um, people working on computers, they took all this, and I like, it's a funny word, but analog analogies. Um, so they, they took what we know, transferred it to the digital world to make us more comfortable about this new digital realism. So you have the desktop, and there's a trash can, and that's an old trash can, and there's a new trash can. And you have a calculator. Of course, everybody knows it's easier to do calculations in Excel, but um, you know, for the early adapters, a calculator was slightly more comfortable. Uh, you have file cabinets, you have uh, magnifying glasses to look for something. Have you ever used a magnifying glass on your computer? No. Um, there are folders or directories on Windows. Um, so they took all this stuff, transfer transferred it to the digital uh, reality, and then let's say around 2000, uh, there was all this enthusiasm, you had uh, the, the dot-com uh, bust, but that's not so important. Um, but this whole digital world developed its own language and its own theories and its own techniques and technologies and tools and stuff like that. Um, uh, like communities, open source, um, sharing, file sharing, it's really interesting. Um, scripting, things like that. They all refer to analog things. Of course, a community is you guys here. It's a community and open source could have been something before uh, the digital revolution, but it's really uh, something that developed in the digital uh, reality. And what we see now is that these uh, digital things are like transferring back to the to the analog world and are like mingling around. And uh, so first you saw this stuff getting digital, and now digital stuff is getting analog again. And the funny thing is that there is no world, the word for, um, you know, you have, when you have a paper and you scan it, you digitize it. And when you have a digital thing and you print it out, it's not really a word for uh, analogize or something. Um, somebody told me there is, it's materialize, of course. And there's a famous company in Belgium called Materialize that does 3D printing. Um, so one example um, is, this is a making off of the book cover of the book Tactile. Um, it's a book about graphic designers uh, exploring, again, re-exploring, rediscovering um, analog uh, methods of working. Like um, This really refers to 3D modeling, but it's in paper. Um, so it's, it's the lettering of the book, and you see spheres and, uh, and cones, which are really actually basic digital models. Um, and it's not anti-digital, of course, because they, they take a digital photo of this uh, analog setting and they resample it on the computers, so it's a merger, it's a hybrid form of digital and analog. Um, there are actually, in the last few years, three books uh, published on this team of all graphic designers and artists exploring the analog world, like if it's something new, and it's probably young people born in the digital age and finding something new. But it's interesting that this is all like, this wave comes over and then it pulls back and it leaves a lot and, and it mixes. Um, so we were working on this uh, exhibition and we decided, not everybody agreed, but we decided that it was about dig design in the post-digital uh, era because it was not about digital technologies, it was about how these digital technologies merged with analog things and everything I explained. Um, so these are a few uh, projects from, uh, from us and from other designers. Um, um, it's worth to say that it was, um, it was an international exhibition, so it was uh, the six of us who uh, started it were from uh, Holland, Belgium and uh, the US. So we invited roughly other people from those uh, countries. Um, this was the, oh, it's really dark, but this was uh, the setup of the show with, uh, it was a piece by uh, the very many uh, French architects who lives in New York. Um, one example, this was the, um, um, how do you call it in English, I don't know. The, the poster of the exhibition was done by the um, Eindhoven design company EDAV, uh, who made uh, evolving, um, um, poster, 
uh, corporate design, evolving corporate design for the exhibition because it's traveling around the world. Uh, next year it will be in Holland and it's always growing and developing. So it's not a fixed set of works. It's works that uh, are open-ended and involve other people to uh, collaborate on it. So they made this uh, installation. On the left you have, a, it's called Debug. On the left you have a bug tracker. Um, you see a small, it's not a cricket, but uh, at the final exhibition they used a house cricket. Um, and they put them in a, in a small uh, frame with the glass on top and they use a, a stencil to kind of um, lead the insects. But of course insects are not uh, that easy to lead and they, they, uh, they walk over the, the stencil. Um, and then they track it and they, the, the color of the lines, I'll show you the next one, um, the color of the lines are determined by the speed and the orientation of the insects. And when they stop, you see a blob. Um, blue blobs, red blobs. So this was the corporate identity of the Bits and Pieces uh, exhibition. Um, another project is by uh, my dear colleague and friend, Lucas Maassen, um, who knows nothing about scripting. He's, he's horrible at it. Um, but he really likes the language and, and the opportunities it gives. So he made a chair. He's always uh, exploring the chairs and um, what you can do with it and when is a chair a chair. And uh, he made a script um, to make a chair. And he, I think he gave this script to his father, like, make a chair with this script. Um, and if you know something about scripting, you know that this is not valid, but you can at least read it a little bit. Um, the script says, like, use every, uh, for every piece a new material, use it as a prefab material, so something you get at a gamma, and only cut it to size, use it at the best place, and stuff like that. Uh, and then change to the next material and do the loop all over again. Um, this is a project uh, by Lucas Maassen and ourselves. It's uh, called the Brainwave Sofa, and it's actually a kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, critique or not a critique, but at the notion of creativity. Everybody thinks about creativity, and then you have the designer, and he has a great ID. He sits in his sofa making the ID, and then uh, he, he elaborates on it. It takes a year, and then you have this fantastic design. Um, and, and we looked at how can we rip out that whole uh, process. So uh, this is uh, Lucas, when we put on the EEG, um, how do you call it, a MUTS? Um, and we measured his uh, brain waves. I'm not going too deep into it, but if you know something about it, it's the alpha waves that we measured. Um, and you have this, this application, this program for uh, neurofeedback, um, in which you can look at the screen and you see your brain waves coming, passing by. Um, talking about this wave of digitalness, it's this one. Um, and, and by looking at it, you can actually influence the, the peaks and, the, and the, the form, so to say. And in this example, we uh, also used opening and closing of the eyes to, to uh, make higher and lower portions. Um, this is a few minutes uh, sampling of the 3D data, and we took a, a, a three-second portion from it when he uh, closed his eyes. Um, what we did then, we just took this digital file and uh, sent it to a computer-controlled uh, milling machine to uh, mill it out of foam. Um, and we thought this was a very normal thing to do, but actually nobody ever milled foam. So that was actually a whole... Um, oh, battery low, okay. Um, <laughs> so now it says that I have to, <laughs> to seek assistance. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christoph? Uh, well, m maybe you should uh, uh, consider the, to. Um, this is post digital. Make this uh, okay. project. Yeah, okay. I'll wink. We will uh, so, it. this is the milling of the foam. Next slide. Uh, here it's uh, slightly more finished. Uh, you can just go on. Yeah. Well, no, one, one, one. Oh, here? the punchline's gone. So, then it was uh, felted by hand. Uh, we looked at, at all possible methods of uh, uh, upholstering from digital files, but it, this was just done by hand. It's much uh, cheaper and quicker, actually. So it's a, a natural felt, and it really um, honors the codes of a sofa, so otherwise it would not be a sofa. And it was uh, blocked all over the place, and I really like what Wired uh, wrote about it. It's the next one. This is your brain on the sofa. Um, okay, next one. 
Okay. Uh, um, we're out of time, so if ah. you maybe two or three minutes, but then uh, you'll have to discuss. Okay, then quickly uh, move on. This is a teapot. It's really cool. Uh, it's actually the oldest 3D model ever made, and we uh, it's it's in in uh, in a lot of movies, and it's a cult icon. You can just continue. Uh, it's used all over the world. Um, this is Toy Story. Next, Up. Simpsons. You can't even see it. Next, uh, and we made one in porcelain to observe what an object, uh, what happens to an object when it moves from analog 30 years into the digital world and back to analog. So you have this all faceted thing. Ah, oh, yeah, it's a long story indeed. This is a 3D printing. It's our. It's a new project for the next exhibition. And when you when you continue, we build a 3D printer. It can print stuff, which is nice. This is my head, um, and it resembles a lot. Um, the oldest technique in making stuff is uh, pottery, and it's the same system. You you make sausages and you put them together, and then you get an object. So we merge the two. And this is really last week uh, experiments, and we are 3D printing uh, clay now and uh, exa examining what you can do when, when you can 3D print uh, ceramic objects. Uh, I think that's it. It says questions now. Yes. And because um, I, I'm a teacher, and there is this one thing they learn you, and that's when you pose a question, you have to wait at least 10 seconds because the average is one second that a teacher waits. So I just I just do it, I'm not going to wait. Yes, there's one question. How do you earn money with this? <laughs> it's very often asked, and it's only three slides left. So, um, you have fundings, of course, but uh, last year, it's uh, one slide earlier, it's really nice to see. 2008, August, this is the stock share from Fortis, which you all know. At, <laughs> at that little arrow, we decided we wanted to earn, uh, to have more money to invest into projects uh, when there's no client. So, next slide. We sold 100 shares of, uh, of stock to friends, clients, family, uh, and totally strangers. And the only thing we said is till 2030, each year you get a dividend in uh, Natura, in, in objects. Um, this is us selling the stocks to all these people not reading the letters. Each year in summertime, we have a shareholders meeting, which is a barbecue with cocktails, and the cocktail is decided by the chief shareholder, who is my nice brother. And this year, we gave this 3D printed medals because it was a horrible year, as you all know. And this was very cheap to produce because we had this 3D printer.